Since the dawn of the 21st century, scientific discovery has rushed forward at lightning speed. Genetics, physics, computerized technology, robotics, virtual reality. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert as they uncover the truths behind this ultimate scientific deception. Welcome to Sci Friday. It's time for... Welcome to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we're delighted that... We are once again bringing you science. (laughs) Yes, which just means knowledge. It's from the Latin knowledge. And so that pretty much encompasses everything. But our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, said we should worship him, love him with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our minds. Minds. And uh, that's what we endeavor to do on this program. You know what else he promised? He promised that in the end times, knowledge would increase. Right. And there are things that are coming to knowledge now, coming to light that have not been known in previous generations. And that is why it's so, this is an exciting time to be alive. You know, one of those things we're going to talk talk about next week when we discuss the Shroud of Turin. Ooh. So you want to make sure, mark it on your calendar just to watch that. But uh, today we're going to be talking about something else that may not seem like it's technically science. Uh, but before we get to the not technically science, when really it is because... Science just means knowledge. Um, I want to discuss something that is not related to this at all. Hmm, Okay. In a minute, we're going to be talking about Valpurgisnacht because Derek and I are recording this on the final day of April, Mm -hmm. which is Valpurgisnacht. And we'll explain that after I discuss this. Okay. That is that there is a hepatitis of unknown origin Mm -hmm. that is sweeping... I will say Western countries. Right, right. Primarily NATO countries and Japan. It's it's very strange because the uh, hepatitis cases, as they've been mapped out, and I'll, I'll put that and image up on the screen. And this is as of the time we're recording this, so mm-hmm. it may change in the next week or two. Because they're working very hard to try to track this down, the, ca- the cause and the uh, the cure, of course. Uh, but also the diagnosis, because I think that there are some doctors who may have seen a an acute case of hepatitis in a child and not known that that's what was going on. Right. And as of this recording, uh, 200 cases worldwide, 20 here in the United States, including a couple in Wisconsin with really bad outcomes. One child needed a liver Mm -hmm. transplant and another, uh, well, died. And these are all children under the age of 10, which is really odd. I read a report this morning that was about nine cases in Alabama. And it ran from October of last year through uh, the end of February of 2022. And they looked at those nine cases. All nine had adenovirus 41. Mm -hmm. Um... Quite a number of other viruses, childhood viruses like RSV, were also uh, discovered within the blood and serum of these children. And it's probably not unusual for children to have a lot of viruses, but one of the uh, explanations that I'm seeing a lot in the news is that these are children whose immune systems have been compromised because they've been kept indoors and away from other children. However, the report on these Alabama cases described all nine as immunocompetent, which means that they have very good immune systems. Hmm. This is really a puzzle. I mean, uh, more than half of the cases are in the UK. Mm -hmm. We've got, uh, again, about two dozen cases here in the United States. Japan, as you say, most of the nations where where this has shown up are either in the West, members of NATO or allied with members Isn't of that NATO, odd? which is very, very strange. Now, if you're a conspiracy theorist, this will m- make the hairs on your back of your neck tingle. And frankly, we are not coincidence theorists. No, so we're not. There's and something odd going on here. Well, as I say, it could be that uh, what we generally call third world nations are yet to recognize it and report on it. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones that are on the big map are the United States, a lot of Western European countries, and Japan, uh, Nordic countries. Uh, Great Britain has a lot of cases. Right, right. And as you say, the UK Health Security Agency is thinking that perhaps because these children were isolated from one another during the lockdown, they weren't exposed to the common adenoviruses that they usually encounter, which usually cause stomach upset, Mm -hmm. nausea, things like that. But they get over it. But now, because they haven't been exposed to it, um, it's causing a more severe outcome. Yes, these children begin 
with stomach upset, sometimes upper respiratory illnesses. Um, if you have a child that is going through this, more than likely it is a coronavirus or an adenovirus, something that causes what appears to be stomach flu or uh, upper respiratory, um, a cold. Mm-hmm. But if your child complains day after day, especially of a stomach ache, and especially if you start to see that child's eyes turn yellow, get to your doctor right away. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is something that Sharon has been watching for a very long time. She tracks emerging diseases. In fact, if you remember Sci Friday in our first iteration, um, we were among the first, not to pat ourselves on the back, but this is just because this is what Sharon has done for 20 years. She's got a degree in molecular biology and tracks emerging and unusual diseases. And we were among the first in the world to raise the alarm about the SARS-2 virus coming out of uh, China, out of Wuhan. And, you know, honestly, I do look for that kind of stuff, but I have to uh, credit a lot of the people on the ground who right. were using Twitter in China, and they were speaking in English, and they were they were transmitting that information to the English-speaking world. And, frankly, most of the world does read English. It does, yeah, especially in the scientific community. Mm, exactly. English or Chinese. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we want to make sure that you are aware of that, and we will keep our eyes on that developing uh, story. Uh, today is April 30th. As we're recording this, yeah. As mm-hmm. we were, we're recording. It was probably getting towards the end of May when this is airing. It's going to be about the third week of May. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, we'll discuss our May deal, by the way, for our uh, GHTV store after the break. Um, Valpurgisnacht, it's perhaps a name you've never heard before. It is a holiday that is celebrated on April 30th. It is the eve of Valpurgis Day, Mm -hmm. St. Valpurgis. She was a, a, a Brit. She was from Devonshire. Hmm. In the uh, 8th century, she died in 7... She was born in 7... No, wait. She died in 777. And she was canonized about 100 years later Mm -hmm. by... um, Oh, gosh. Pope Adrian II. Thank you very much. Um, Adrian? Adrian II, yep. Uh, Interesting. Um, (laughs) She was reputed... To have had a wonderful reputation, she was a missionary to the Franks. We tend to think of Frank as French, but no, it's actually German. She had gone to uh, an area that is now Württemberg and preached the gospel. She headed up an abbey there as an abbess, and her two brothers were also there with her. They are also saints to this day. Her father had been a a minister in the Catholic Church, Mm -hmm. and Because she fought against what we would call Wicca, it wasn't called Wicca back then, it was simply paganism and and, uh, individuals that were called Hexa, the Hexen, the the, uh, uh, witches. Um, The night before her holy day, it is said that the witches go up to the Brocken Mm -hmm. on the top of the Hartz Mountains and they fly around and uh, have their secret ceremonies. And the, the following day is supposed to be the holy day. So it's sort of like All Saints Day on mm-hmm. November 1st and Halloween on October 31st. Uh, what, what's going on in the world right now is that our cultures are moving more and more towards paganism mm-hmm. and away from traditional Christianity, traditional theism. We're now going back to polytheism and even the idea that you have to sacrifice to deities. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not talking about blood sacrifice necessarily, but in some cases, small animals are sacrificed. Um, you would give of your, your money, your extra food, things like that. But on uh, uh, Valpurgisnacht, you, before Valpurgis lived, you would celebrate the uh, Floralia in Rome. The Floralia. The Floralia, or Floriala. Is it uh, to do with... It's Flora is the name of a goddess, uh-huh. and it was her, like the Saturnalia, uh, okay. the Floralia. Okay. Right, it was right, right. her mm-hmm. special time of the year. This is at a time when end of April, 1st of May, is traditionally spring or the beginning of summer. 
So you would celebrate. Mm-hmm. Now mm-hmm. think of the, the traditional legend of Persephone. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And worshipped in the ancient world as Kore. Yes. Yeah. Now yeah. here's an interesting tidbit. Valpurgus is sometimes depicted holding a sheaf of grain. Like the Roman grain goddess Ceres. Or Demeter or Persephone. Yes. Or sometimes Inanna. Yeah, yeah. In Europe, Valpurgisnacht, and even parts of the United States and elsewhere, Valpurgisnacht is celebrated with just craziness. Great bonfires and dancing and lots and lots of alcohol. Lots of Mm -hmm. alcohol. Yeah, that that was a characteristic of the uh, Floralia. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Unlike, according to the the Book of Knowledge, Wikipedia, (laughs) which we don't normally recommend, but for a quick read on things. It's a good starting place. And then always read in the citations at the bottom and go to those. Do your own research, yeah. Yeah. Um, this was a game that was aimed more at the uh, ple- the plebs rather than the patrician class, the yes. uh, the upper crust. The, this was for the commoners. Well, sort of like Saturnalia, that was more for the commoners, and they right. got to pretend to be the patrician class. Right, right. Well, yeah, the Floralia was uh, a, a big deal. It was a, uh, a six-day festival that involved <laughs> licentious, pleasure-seeking activities. <laughs> now let's discuss what happens on May 1st. So... April 30th, Valpurgis Nacht, we now have a celebration supposedly of witches Mm -hmm. that are invoking the devil, and it's a time of mischief, and the bonfires are supposedly to keep the demons away, but probably not. Well, it's it's a summoning. We we talked in in other... That's how I write it in the Red Wing saga. Mm -hmm. In fact, book six, book seven, sorry... Uh, has a, a beginning, no, six, begins with this idea of Alpergusnacht. And it's Adele who is drawn into the woods. And it's it's a, the same time that they're going to be having this bonfire. Mm-hmm. And uh, her aunt and her aunt's friend are discussing the local traditions. That's a very old tradition, the idea of setting fires to draw the spirits of the ancestors in. That goes back to ancient Mesopotamia. Yes, it does, which takes us again to Inanna. Um, There is a goddess, a uh, pagan deity in the Norse tradition called, I think, um, I want to say Iduma, something like that. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, I I don't have it in front of me. It's it's Idun, I think, I-D-U-N-N. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's really similar to Adonis and Adana hmm. and Adonai. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying at all that's related to our no, Lord no, and no. Savior. But we see the fallen realm twist the Lord's real names over and over again. Um, but this, this entity, it's a female de- entity, and she is also associated with this time of the year. Hmm. And she's also associated with apples, which is... Uh, a very interesting, interesting. thing, yeah. exactly. Mm. So this time of the year, we also have the following day, May 1st. When I was a little girl at our grade school, we would gather around the flagpole, and it would be decorated with streamers, and we would all dress up with little flowers in our hair, and we would do the maypole dance. Did, did nobody, in, and I know that your community where you grew up, a small town very in southern Christian, Indiana, very Christian. Very conservative. Nobody understood the pagan connotations, the pagan origins of the May Day, the Nobody May-pole? ever researched it. Nobody ever taught it. It was wow. just a custom. Of course, I can't say that I knew any different either when I was younger. But uh, it's, it's the, the imagery of the maypole is pretty obvious you don't need to be Freud to figure that one out. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. By the way, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, I'm going to tell you how the Maypole associates with Isaac Newton. Ooh, Sci Friday continues after this. This program is an outreach of Gilbert House Ministries, one of the ways we share the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Each week, we produce Unraveling Revelation, a study of Bible prophecy from Genesis to Revelation, Sci Friday, a look at science news through a biblical lens, our weekly study of the Bible, the Gilbert House Fellowship as we go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order, and my podcast, A View from the Bunker, and we rely on your support. There are two ways you can join us in this mission. First and foremost, your prayers. We truly and deeply appreciate your prayerful support. 
And if you are led to help us financially, you can do that two ways. First, you can donate through a link at our website, gilberthouse.org. Second, you can visit our online shop, a sort of virtual book table where you'll find our books and DVDs. Just click the link at gilberthouse.org or scan the QR code on your screen. And during the month of May, save 20% on all DVDs with the promo code MAY20. That's MAY20. Again, thank you for your prayers and thank you for your support. Welcome back to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. Isaac Newton. I'm Sharon Gilbert. I'm huh. not Isaac Newton at all. But strangely enough, he has to do with apples as mm-hmm. well. Isn't that a strange one? Uh, so get your tea, get your coffee, and join us. Um, just relax. Watch these shows. Some people tell us they watch these shows as they're going to bed. We hear that over and over Somehow again. Somehow our voices are soothing. And we take no offense to that. We don't. Actually, we love it. So <laughs> if you're in bed enjoying this, uh, good night. Close your eyes now. Um, <laughs> but, but do we, take advantage of the of the uh, mobile app to uh, to do so. Oh, yeah. Our new mobile app, which gets you all of our video content, not just these weekly Sci Friday broadcasts, but our weekly study of end times prophecy, unraveling revelation, my weekly podcast called A View from the Bunker, our weekly Bible study, which is audio only. So if you can take it. Uh, that's uh, like about three if, hours. If you worth. can take it, ah. <laughs> well, I mean, three hours of our voices every it's week. A that lot. Could, I that mean, should be enough on. to keep you sleeping regularly every night of the week. So <laughs> <laughs> you'll find a link at uh, the website SciFriday.tv. Uh, it's in the top menu bar there, or just uh, you point your uh, point the phone at your phone at the uh, QR code. QR uh, on code the right here. Right. You can also search in the app stores for Gilbert House. Mm-hmm. Uh, two words. Um, also, we are on Roku. Roku. Search for Gilbert House. Yeah, and you'll find it in the uh, channel store at uh, Roku.com, and uh, I'll put a, uh, a link, a uh, QR code for that link here as well, and that way you'll get us on the big screen without having to, you know, cast from your mobile device up to your TV. But multiple ways to uh, get uh, th- about so three hours a week of, uh, of content from our house to your house. Our house to yours. Literally. By the way, we are not... We are still with Skywatch TV. Some people have asked. We haven't left. They're not getting rid of us. We are there forever. Uh, But Derek and I are expanding our own ministry, and Tom has encouraged us in that, so we thank him Mm. for that. He's also doing his best to help us in ways that are sort of... Anonymous. Behind the scenes, right? Behind yep. the scenes. But we want to let you know that we have our own store at our website now, gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org, and QR code will take you to that store the month of May, 20% off all of, of our DVDs. Yeah, just use promo code MAY20 at gilberthouse.org slash store, or just scan the QR code right here. Indeed. Um, Isaac Newton. Yeah. In, in the 1660s, when the restoration occurred, Charles II was uh, brought back and he was put on the English throne. He was the party king. Mm-hmm. Yes. They, f- they got to have theater again and they got to have parties and they got to drink because during the Cromwell days, it was uh, very, very conservative. I- I'm not sure Cromwell was all that bad, but uh, Charles II, they thought, was better. Yeah. So Charles II came back and the Maypole came back So because Cromwell had banned it. Sure. So the Maypole came back and it, one was, it was really, really super tall. And I can't remember how meters tall it was, but it was one of the tallest ever in uh, Great Britain. And it was in London and it was there for about a decade. Mm-hmm. Then it was uh, blown down in a wind and moved to another location and used by as a telescope mount mm-hmm. by Sir Isaac Newton. That's, that's remarkable. Um, Newton had some interesting ideas on end times prophecy. We discussed that, uh, well, I, I was part of a panel that discussed it with uh, Dr. Michael Heiser at the Skywatch TV conference in 2019. That was a great panel. Yeah, yeah. Our um, late friend, uh, Natalina. Yep, was on she was on the panel, along with uh, some other uh, really intelligent people, Doug Van Dorn, uh, Dr. Judd Burton, Josh Peck, um, Doug Overmeyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that was that was a really interesting discussion. Disagree with, uh, with Sir Isaac on, on some of his conclusions about prophecy, but he no doubt he was a brilliant man. But you, for, if you're interested in his stuff, uh, David Flynn wrote a lot about Isaac Newton in The Temple at the Center of Time. Yes, that was a brilliant work. I, mm-hmm. I Frankly, I couldn't get my head around it. But I've uh, had to read to it twice, yeah. and I need to read it two more times. David was a savant. <laughs> yes, yeah. he truly was. But um, what, what's interesting, again, where we see this overlap between the scientific rigor and the scientific method and mm-hmm. the supernatural realm has... Uh, 
only increased. I mean, we, we tend to think that since the Enlightenment, the, the Western world has moved in a more scientific direction where we look to science as the arbiter of truth. But the fact is that we are not moving into a, a Star Trek uh, scientific, atheistic, rational world. We're moving into a, a pagan, we're going back to the pagan realm. Yes. That, uh, and the belief systems that dominated the world before the advent of, of Christianity. And the scientific method is being employed to try to manipulate the spirit realm as well. That's where Helena Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley, who we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, tried to develop their systems. They were trying to come up with scientific ways of Mm -hmm. commanding and controlling the spirits in the unseen realm. Our Lord tells a parable about a man who is uh, inhabited by a demon, and the demon is cast out of him. So the house is all clean. The house is totally swept and clean. And then the demon since nothing else comes into the house to take its place, he says, oh, hey, it's nice and clean now. I'm going to bring back all my friends, my crazy wild friends, and we're going to party in this guy's house. In a way, when the Enlightenment came in and logic took the place of faith, um, the house in mankind's heart was swept clean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that had to be occupied by something, reason, did not do it. Mankind is wired to be a believer Mm -hmm. in something. Mankind is wired to understand that the supernatural realm does exist. And so we are wired to to believe in it and to seek it out. Mm -hmm. The problem is, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, the entities that are inhabiting your nice, clean house aren't very nice. No. And this goes back to ancient Mesopotamia and the spirits that were known to the Mesopotamians as the Apkalu. Mm-hmm. And about 20 years ago, a uh, scholar by the name of Amar Anus, who is Estonian. Brilliant man. Yes, has written a number of papers that are foundational for the research that we've done. He showed that the Apkalu of Mesopotamia were the watchers of the Hebrews. They were one and the same. Now, watchers were just very powerful, angelic beings. We see them mentioned in Daniel chapter 4, where they come down and they decree the punishment over Nebuchadnezzar for his pride. But the Apkalu um, were believed to be the supernatural agents of the god Enki, which is just the compound word meaning god or lord of the Mm -hmm. earth. (laughs) God of this world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, because his temple was the the Iabzu, the house of the abyss. Yes. So he sent forth these Apkalu, which roughly translated into English means big water men. (laughs) Yeah, that's what it means. I I don't want to picture those guys. Yeah. And they came forth to bring uh, knowledge that was the basis of human civilization, included everything from um, how to make beer to uh, how to uh, cast spells. The mez. Right. Inanna controlled the mez. Exactly, the mez, the the concepts and and principles that guide human civilization. But um, there are a number of parallels between their story and the stories of the watchers punished by God, as described in the book of First Enoch. But what I found really interesting in researching my most recent book, The Second Coming of Saturn, is that the practice of summoning these entities from this underground realm, which is where the uh, the Abzu, the abyss, was located, from which the Apkalu emerged, goes back to uh, the, the ancient Hurrian culture, dated to the middle of the 4th millennium BC, around 3500 BC or thereabouts, there's a site in northern Syria that's been excavated by a husband and wife team from UCLA uh, called uh, Urkesh, which might be the ur mm-hmm. from which Abraham came. Yes. Anyway, that's neither her nor there. But the uh, focal point of their religion was a 40-foot deep pit called the... Uh, uh, the the Abi, mm-hmm. which is the origin of the Sumerian word Abzu. A-B-I. A-B-I. It's also the origin of the Hebrew word Ov. And I mm-hmm. go into all of this in the book, The Second Coming of Saturn. So you can trace the uh, the Hebrew word Ov, which means ritual pit, like the one used by the, uh, the uh, medium of Endor to summon the spirit of Samuel, and uh, the Sumerian Abzu back to this ancient Hurrian culture, which then in turn we trace back to the plains of Ararat, in the middle of the fourth millennium BC. In other words, the land below the mountains where Noah's Ark came to rest. And these uh, people were using this ritual pit to summon entities from the netherworld and doing things that we can recognize in modern day uh, witchcraft rituals, like scribing a a protective circle on the floor Mm -hmm. or or making it with uh, with flour or salt or some such, um, offering uh, 
sacrifices to these underworld gods, it goes back more than 5,000 years. Well, you and I are working on a book right now that uh, we've been we've talked about for a while, but I'm also trying to finish the next Red Wing Saga book. It's This one is taking me some time. It's going to be a good book, I think, but but uh, I, sometimes a book is it's a struggle. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. it comes really quickly. This one's it's tougher. But you and I are writing a book that we're calling The Gates of Hell. And one of the themes that we're seeing repeated again and again and again is that the idea of ritual pits, but also the idea of the omphalos, the yeah. idea of the center of the world, the navel of the world. Well, those... those uh, um, the, those, what am I trying to say? The pillars? The, no, uh, no, no, no. The, the maypole. The maypole. Like an obelisk, yeah. same sort of principle. Same principle. Mm-hmm. It represents a tree. It represents the, the center of the world, mm-hmm. but it also is phallic. Yes, yes. Like the men here, the standing stones. Uh, as And we mentioned this on Unraveling Revelation a couple of weeks ago, the uh, stone that David's son Absalom erected in his own honor because he had no son to keep his name in remembrance, in other words, to preserve his existence in the yes, afterlife. Yes, exactly. So the idea of little girls dancing around yes. this, the supposed center of the world uh-huh. that is right over an Apsu. Yeah. Because that was the belief that the Apsu was the center of the world. Right, right. So it's uh, trying to create a system for controlling and manipulating the spirit realm. This is a, a system very old, for chaos, a system for controlling chaos. Yes. This is a very old thing. It goes back more than 5,000 years. And again, the practitioners of uh, the followers, descendants, spiritually speaking of Blavatsky and Crowley, who are today trying to find ways to use the internet to, to, to create virtual magic in the, in the, uh, in the virtual realm, even. Mm-hmm. Uh, It it is really no different than what these uh, practitioners of this were doing uh, more than a thousand years before Abraham walked the earth. We will, sometime in June, we're going to address this idea of virtual sin and virtual reality. And I've written on this before, so I feel really, you know, really uh, compelled to discuss it. So stay tuned for that in June. Uh, But we want to remind you that if you're interested in some of these places that Derek discussed in Turkey... We're going to Turkey in October of this year, so go to skywatchinturkey.com, mm-hmm. and you can see all of the details there. We'll also go to Israel next March, so go to skywatchinisrael.com, and you may even have QR codes that you put up there for those. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, do so take I don't do the these. editing, so I could just say to <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, you just say it, and I have to, then in the post, I have to do it. But that's fine, because we want to make it easy for you to get the information and find out, because... Seeing these sites and understanding the connection between the, the the actual history of these places, the geography of these places, helps to understand why certain things happen in certain ways. And the more the archaeologists discover, as you've seen here on this program over the last few weeks, the more it confirms the history of the Bible. Science is not incompatible with the Word of God, and that's why we do this program. And we thank you for watching. This is Sci Friday. Sci Friday is a viewer supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at SciFriday.tv and GilbertHouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Join us each week as we go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order.